Job, Part 1 2. When Deborah got back home, she found her husband at the stove. He was reluctantly tending the fire, the pot, the wooden spoon. His upright spirit was bent on simple earthly things and tolerated no miracle in his sight. He smiled at his wife's belief in the rabbi. His artless piety required no mediating power between God and man. Menuchem is going to get well, but it will take a long time. With these words, Deborah came into the house. It will take a long time, repeated Mendel like an evil echo. Sighing, Deborah rehung the basket from the ceiling. The three older children came in from play. They descended on the basket, which they had missed now for some days, and swung it violently back and forth. With both hands, Mendel's singer seized his sons, Jonas and Shemaria. Miriam, the girl, fled to her mother. Mendel boxed his son's ears. They wailed. He unbuckled his belt and swung it through the air, as if the leather belonged to his body, as if it were the natural extension of his hand. Mendel Singer felt every smacking blow his son's buttocks endured. A sinister roar erupted in his head. His wife's cries of alarm fell into his own din, reduced to insignificance. It was like tossing glasses of water into a raging sea. He could not feel where he stood. He staggered about with the swinging, banging belt, hit the walls, the tables, the benches, and did not know whether the errant or landing blows gave him more pleasure. The clock on the wall finally struck three, the hour when the schoolboys gathered in the afternoon. With empty belly, for he had not eaten, the choking agitation still in his throat, Mendel began reciting from the Bible word by word, sentence by sentence. The bright chorus of children's voices repeated word for word, sentence for sentence. It was as if the Bible were being sounded by many bells. Like bells as well, the pupils' trunks swung forward and backward, while over their heads Menuchem's basket swung in almost the same rhythm. Today Mendel's sons took part in the lesson. Their father's rage bubbled, cooled, expired, because their ringing recitation preceded the others. To test them, he left the room. The chorus of children went on sounding, led by his son's voices. He could rely on them. Jonas, the elder, was strong as a horse. Shemaya, the younger, was sly as a fox. Jonas would trot in, stamping, his head bent forward with hands hanging, globular cheeks, endless hunger, tousled hair which sprang in violent profusion beyond the edges of his cap. Tranquil, almost sneaking, with a sharp profile, always alert, bright eyes, thin arms, hands buried in his pockets, his brother Shemarya came after him. They never quarreled. They were so unlike. They had no common goods and possessions. They had sealed an alliance. Shemarya fashioned wondrous things from tin cans, matchboxes, shards of glass, horns, withies. Jonas could have blown them down and destroyed them with his strong breath. But he admired his brother's delicate skills. His small dark eyes gleamed curious and cheerful like little sparks between his cheeks. A few days after her return, Deborah judged the time had come to detach Menuchem's basket from the ceiling. Not without ceremony, she delivered the little boy to the other children. You're going to take him for a walk, said Deborah. When he gets tired, you'll carry him. Don't let him fall, God forbid. The holy man told me he'll get well. Don't do him any harm. From this time the children's torment began. They dragged Menuchim through the town like a curse. They let him lie. They let him fall. They smarted under the derision of others their age who came running after them when they took Menuchim out for a walk. The little boy had to be held up between two. He did not place one foot before the other like a human being. He waddled on his legs as on two broken hoops. He stood still. He collapsed. Finally, Jonas and Shemarya let him lie. They laid him in a corner in a sack. There he played with dog dew, horse manure, pebbles. He gobbled everything. He scratched whitewash from the walls and stuffed his mouth full, then coughed and turned blue in the face. A piece of filth he was kept in the corner. Sometimes he would start crying. The boys sent Miriam to him to comfort him. Delicate, coquettish, with frisky thin legs, a nasty, hateful loathing in her heart, she would approach her ridiculous brother. The delicacy with which she caressed his ashen-gray wrinkled face had something murderous about it. She looked warily around, to right and left, and gave her brother's thigh a sharp slap. 
He wailed. Neighbors looked out the window. She screwed up her face in a charade of weeping. Everyone felt sorry for her and questioned her. One summer's day, while it was raining, the children dragged Menuchim out of the house and placed him in the tub where rainwater had collected for half a year. Worms swam round, bits of fruit and moldy bread crusts. They held him by his bowed legs and dipped his broad gray head into the water a dozen times in the gleeful, gruesome hope of hauling out a corpse. But Menuchim lived. He rattled, spewed out the water, the worms, the moldy bread, the bits of fruit, and lived. Nothing happened to him. Then in silence and full of dread they lugged him back home. A great fear of God's little finger, which had ever so faintly wagged, gripped the two boys and the girl. They didn't speak among themselves the whole day. Their tongues were stuck to their palates. They opened their lips to articulate a word, but no sound formed in their throats. It stopped raining. The sun came out. Little streams flowed gaily along the gutters of the streets. It would have been the time to set paper boats sailing and watch how they floated down to the canal. But absolutely nothing happened. The children slunk back into the house like dogs. The whole afternoon they continued waiting for Menuchim's death. Menuchim did not die. Menuchim did not die. He remained among the living, a mighty cripple. Thenceforth Deborah's womb was dry and barren. Menuchim was the last misbegotten fruit of her belly, as if her womb refused to bring forth still more tragedy. In fleeting seconds she wrapped herself round her husband. They were quick as lightning, dry lightning on the distant summer horizon. Long, cruel, and sleepless were Deborah's nights. A wall of hot glass separated her from her husband. Her breasts wilted, her belly swelled like a mockery of her infertility, her thighs turned hard, and lead hung on her feet. One summer morning she woke up earlier than Mendel. A sparrow twittering on the window sill had wakened her. Its trill still rested in her ear, the memory of something dreamt, something happy, like the voice of a sunbeam. The warm early twilight penetrated the pores and cracks of the wooden shutters, and though the edges of the furniture were still submerged in nocturnal shadows, Deborah's eyes were now clear, her thoughts hard, her heart cool. She cast a glance at her sleeping husband and discovered the first white hairs in his black beard. He cleared his throat in his sleep. He snored. She quickly leapt up before the clouded mirror. She ran cold streaming fingertips through her thinning tresses, pulled one strand after another down her brow and searched for white hairs. She believed she had found a single one, seized it with a strong two-finger twist and yanked it out. Then she opened her nightshirt before the mirror. She saw her flabby breasts, lifted them high, let them fall, rubbed her hand over her hollow yet bulging belly, saw the blue branching veins on her thighs, and decided to get back into bed. She turned around, and her gaze fell startled on her husband's open eye. What are you looking at? she blurted out. He did not answer. It was as if the open eye did not belong to him, for he himself was still sleeping. It had opened independently of him. It had grown curious on its own. The white of the eye seemed whiter than usual. The pupil was tiny. The eye reminded Deborah of an ice-covered sea with a black dot in the middle. It could scarcely have been open for a minute, but Deborah counted that minute a decade. Mendel's eye reclosed. He breathed on peacefully. He was sleeping, no doubt about it. A distant warbling of a million larks arose outside, over the house, under the heavens. The dawning heat of the new day was now soaking into the early morning darkened room. Soon the clock must strike six strokes, the hour when Mendel's singer habitually got up. Deborah did not budge. She remained standing where she had stood when she turned around toward the bed, the mirror at her back. She had never listened so motionless, free of purpose, free of need, free of curiosity, free of desire. She was expecting absolutely nothing. But it seemed to her that she should be expecting something special. All her senses were alert as never before, and yet another pair of new, unfamiliar senses were wakened, underpinning the others. She saw, heard, felt a thousandfold, and absolutely nothing happened.
Only a summer morning was dawning. Only larks were warbling in the unfathomable distance. Only sunbeams squeezed in with hot force through the cracks in the shutters, and the broad shadows on furniture edges narrowed and shrank. And the clock was ticking and readying six strokes, and the man drew a breath. The children lay soundless in the corner by the stove, visible to Deborah, but distant, as if in another space. Absolutely nothing happened. Nevertheless, the will to happen seemed an eternity. The clock struck like a release. Mendel Singer woke, sat straight up in bed, and stared amazed at his wife. Why are you not in bed? he asked, and rubbed his eyes. He hawked and spat. Absolutely nothing in his words or demeanor betrayed that his left eye had been open and had looked out on its own. Perhaps he knew nothing about it. Perhaps Deborah had been mistaken. From that day, desire ceased between Mendel Singer and his wife. Like two people of the same sex, they went to sleep, slept through the nights, woke in the morning. They were embarrassed before each other and did not speak, as in the first days of their marriage. Shame appeared at the beginning of their desire, and at the end of their desire appeared as well. And it all blew over. They talked again. Their eyes did not elude each other. Their faces and bodies aged in the same rhythm like the faces and bodies of twins. The summer was muggy and short of breath and poor in rain. Door and window stood open. The children were seldom at home. They grew quickly in the open air, enlivened by the sun. Even Menuhim grew. His legs remained quite bowed, but they were unquestionably longer. His trunk stretched out as well. Suddenly, one morning, he loosed a shrill cry never before heard. Then he went quiet. A short while later, he said, clearly and audibly, Mama! Deborah hurled herself on him, and from her eyes, which now had long been dry, tears flowed hot, strong, big, salty, painful, and sweet. Say, Mama! Mama! the little child repeated. He repeated the word a dozen times. Deborah repeated it a hundred times. Her prayers had not been in vain. Menuchim spoke, and that one word from the deformed child was sublime as a revelation, mighty as thunder, warm as love, noble as heaven, broad as the earth, fertile as a field, sweet as the sweetest fruit. It was more than the health of the healthy children. It meant that Menuchim should be strong and tall, wise and generous, as the words of the blessing had foretold. However, Still other comprehensible sounds did not come forth from Menuchim's throat. For a long time this one word which he had achieved after so dreadful a silence meant food and drink, sleep and love, desire and pain, heaven and earth. Although he spoke only this word on every occasion, he appeared to his mother Deborah as eloquent as a preacher and as rich in expression as a poet. She understood every word that was concealed in the one, she neglected the other children. She distanced herself from them. She now had only one son, her only son, Menuchim.